And now, it's time to sit back and enjoy the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Broadcast. Attention, people, Earth. Do not resist us. All who oppose us shall be annihilated. We command the most powerful army of monsters in the universe. They are sure to defeat your Earth monsters. All those who are hearing this are now under the control of the Earth Destruction Directive. Hello everyone and welcome to Earth Destruction Directive. I am your host as always, Mr. Luke Giaconetti. Thank you for listening and downloading the show today. Hope everyone enjoyed our last episode where we took a look at uh, two episodes of the original Ultraman featuring the monster Zumbalar and the alien Mephilus. Today we are going to be uh, switching gears a little bit. We're going to be taking a look at a comic, and not just any monster comic, but an indie monster comic. We're going to be taking a look at Ross Radke's Stomped number three. Now I know originally I had said we we're going to be taking a look at both issues three and four of this indie series, uh, but when I was laying the show out, it was going to be, frankly, with covering both books was going to be somewhere above two hours, and I said, you know what? Without a guest, I don't think anybody wants to hear me talk for, for two straight hours. So we're going to cover just issue three, and we'll pick up issue four uh, down the road. We'll try and uh, squeeze it in as a special episode, but I will cover issue four uh, at a later time. Now, we have a lot of news, so let's go and get right into it. The biggest news this time out is that Legendary has revealed the official title of the next installment of the MonsterVerse, Godzilla X Kong. The New Empire, and this was revealed uh, by releasing a very, very brief teaser video, and the official description is, The latest entry in the MonsterVerse franchise follows up the explosive showdown of Godzilla vs. Kong with an all-new cinematic adventure, pitting the almighty Kong and the fearsome Godzilla against a colossal, undiscovered threat hidden within our world, challenging their very existence and our own. The epic new film will delve further into the theories excuse me, into the histories of these titans, their origins, and the mysteries of Skull Island and beyond, while uncovering the mythic battle that helped forge these extraordinary beings and tied them to humankind forever. Now, between the title and the imagery of the teaser, it seems like Hollow Earth may hold many dangers for its new ruler, as well as Goji up on the surface. I really like the use of X in the title. It gives it a very Japanese vibe, like the Millennium Films. And the subtitle is suitably mysterious, Obviously very excited by this news. Time to mark it on your calendars, folks. March 15th, 2024. In literary news, the novelizations of Godzilla and Godzilla Raids Again are set to be released in English for the first time ever. First published in 1955, written by Shigeru Kayama, who created the original stories for both films, the novel is set to be released on October 3rd, 2023, from University of Minnesota Press. Now, I've long heard about these novelizations, but always fouled them under the never going to see them category. Uh, so this news was as welcome as it was unexpected. Pre-orders are up on Amazon, so be sure to check uh, be sure to check them out. It should be fun reading for the fall. Half tip to my brother Jason for tagging me with this information, which uh, I must say spread like wildfire as soon as it was out there. I saw this all over the place on social media. In comic book news, two new releases coming from IDW. The first is a new five-issue miniseries entitled Godzilla, Here There Be Dragons. Uh, the series looks to be in the vein of Godzilla Rage Across Time in that it's taking Goji out of his typical setting and placing him in the 16th century during a lost voyage of Sir Francis Drake. Uh, the series is written by Frank Thierry, whom I know very well from his work on Iron Man. I met him several years ago at, at Heroes Con in Charlotte. Really nice guy. And art is by Inaki Miranda, whose name or Miranda, I guess it could be Inaki Miranda. Uh, I did not recognize their name, uh, but they have many credits for DC Comics on titles such as Harley Quinn and Catwoman. Sounds like a novel setting, and I usually do dig Thierry's stuff, so uh, definitely going to check this out. This series is set to start this June. Also from IDW is the trade paperback entitled Godzilla The Best of Rodan, a collection of stories featuring the flying monster, including Godzilla Legends number 2, Godzilla History's Greatest Monster number 4, Godzilla Rulers of Earth number 5 and more. Uh, Best of Rodan is set to hit the streets in June from IDW as well. In animated news, the trailer for the new Netflix series Gamera Rebirth has dropped. 
along with the first wave of toys corresponding to the kaiju we saw in the trailer. Imagine that. From the information we have, it looks like the series is set in the year 1989, features a group of six graders as at least some of the human characters, which makes sense to me for a Gamera series. Trailer also revealed the second of the five monsters which Gamera shall fight, which is Jiger, in her first appearance since uh, 1980, when she was one of the monsters in God's, uh, Gamera Super Monster. In addition to Jiger and the previously revealed Gauss, speculation is running rampant over the identities of the other three kaiju, but uh, we will just have to wait and see. As I said, vinyl toys are available for pre-order for the rebirth forms of Gamera, Gauss, and Jiger, and I'm sure more will be forthcoming on that front. Gamera Rebirth is set to debut worldwide via Netflix sometime in 2023. In Kickstarter news, Pacific Rim and Skull Island RPG expansions are coming from Evil Genius Games for their Everyday Heroes modern D20 system. Now, I've not played Everyday Heroes, but from what I'm reading, their system is well suited to doing movie adaptions, as they have cinematic adventure sets for properties ranging from The Crow to Rambo to, yes, Pacific Rim and Skull Island. Now, right now, they have available what are called cinematic adventures for these properties on the website DriveThruRPG. Coming May 9th, uh, this Kickstarter will be for what they call cinematic adventure packs, which are, quote, long-form adventures that take your characters from level 1 to level 10 across around 100 hours of gameplay. Not sure I'm the right target for these games, but I will be keeping an eye on this campaign for sure, so if that sounds like something you like to break out with your gaming group, sure to check it out. In other Kickstarter news, the second Kaiju and Cowboys Kickstarter campaign has launched. I backed the first one, which covered issue one of the series back in 2021, so I was surprised to see a second campaign was coming after the long break. I want to say that they actually switched crowdfunding platforms somewhere in the middle there, but they're back on Kickstarter for this one. Uh, the comic from the campaign page, quote, introduces readers to Doc, a humble maintenance bot on an alien planet overrun by kaiju monsters and working with his fellow robots to create a world for humanity to live on and thrive. Unfortunately, it is also a world that is inhabited by all sorts of terrifying monsters that threaten Doc and robots everywhere. Fortunately for them, there's another robot known only as the Hunter who wanders the planet, fighting monsters and looking awesome while doing it. Uh, <laughs> the campaign is live on Kickstarter right now as I'm recording this, so please go check it out. Uh, I got the first issue. It's it's very fun. It's, it's very different. It's not really... Uh, I'm not sure with a title like... Um, uh, Kaiju and Cowboys, what what to expect, but the, the robot aspect and the art is very uh, unique, so we'll probably try to cover that here on the show in the future, too. In Shin Universe news, following on from Fathom Events screening of Shin Godzilla and Shin Ultraman, we are going to be getting Shin Kamen Rider as a one-night screening here in the United States. Now, much like when I reported the Fathom Events screening of Godzilla Tokyo SOS, the date is not actually on the Fathom Events website yet, but AMC Theaters and others are showing Wednesday, May 31st, as the night of the screening. Of course, once this is confirmed one way or the other, I'll give an update. I'm very curious to see if Shin Kamen Rider is more in line with Shin Godzilla or with Shin Ultraman. And either way, it looks like I won't have to wait too long to find out. And finally, in uh-oh, Asylum news... <sighs> The trailer for Ape vs. Mecha Ape, the sequel to Ape vs. Monster, from all the way back in Gaiden 32, you know, in earlier in April, uh, <laughs> the trailer has dropped. It looks, well, it frankly, it looks like the sequel to Ape vs. Monster, so naturally I will probably pick that up at some point. Hat tip again to my brother Jason for pointing me towards this, although maybe I shouldn't be thanking him, considering... Ape vs. Monster. But anyway, all right, that's all the news I've got. So if you've got anything that you think would be of interest here on Earth Destruction Directive, go ahead and send it in, Earth Destruction Directive at yahoo.com, or you can hit me up on Facebook or Twitter, and uh, I'll give you a hat tip and a shout out here on the show. All right, uh, I'm going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get right into issue three of Stomped right here on Earth Destruction Directive. <laughs> Once upon a time, five friends who met on the Bot Talk Transformers forum set out to develop a podcast dedicated to their various interests. Transformers, science fiction, fantasy, and comic books. 
part fanboys and part souls, they came to be known as the fan holes. Their unbridled enthusiasm for podcasting did not end there, and soon enough, their proper podcast spun off into the fan holes network of podcasts. Besides our podcast proper, the fan holes soon had a continuum of genre specific, focused shows such as Mobile Suit Mondays, Transformers Tuesdays, Toku Thursdays, and Sentai Saturdays. New weekly content can be found on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and fanholespodcast.blogspot.com. Fanholes Podcast, the pop culture podcast, made for the fans, by the fans. All right, we are back here on Earth Destruction Directive. Stomped number three was released in digital format in May 2022, and then shipped in July 2022 after its successful Kickstarter campaign by its creator Ross Radke, whom of course we sat down with here at EDD back in Gaiden 28. The comic is 44 pages long, contains three stories, plus two pinups and an additional piece of sketchbook material. Uh, we covered Stomped Issues 1 and 2 back on episode 89, so you might want to go back and check that out uh, before listening to this one, but it is not required to do so. Uh, the cover is by Ross Radke and depicts two of the kaiju from the issue. A mantis-like insect monster colored a sickly yellow-green with pink stripes in the foreground, staring right at the reader, and a blue and pale yellow reptilian creature in profile behind, showing off its crooked crocodilian jawline and row of spines on its head. The combination of the two monsters and the stomped logo, itself green and pink, with numerous, cr with numerous cracks running through each letter, easily identify this as a monster comic, and the eye-popping colors really make it stand out, especially with the foreground kaiju. Our first story is entitled Eye for an Eye. It is with uh, writing and art by Ross Radke and the lettering by Hassan Atzmain Elhau. And um, Hassan did, the, uh, did all the lettering in the previous issues of Stomped, if that name sounds familiar. Our story is 12 pages, and the synopsis goes a little something like this. In Bratzaville, Republic of Congo, a kaiju nicknamed Mokele Imbe 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 Mbembe, leaves the city limits and the UN Kaiju Council targets it for atomic termination what is, once it is at a safe distance. Into this scene enters a team of six scientists and doctors who have been brought together to extract physical samples of the kaiju before it is vaporized. Among the team is Dr. Sofia Zavales, a large animal veterinarian who lost her left hand to a hippopotamus and now uses a prosthetic clamp. Making their way onto the kaiju via wingsuits, the mission quickly goes pear-shaped. One member is eaten out of the air by the kaiju, and another is grievously wounded by a symbiotic giant centipede creature living among the kaiju's scales. When another team member, Dr. Irwin, a biochemist, takes a sample of the kaiju's eye fluid, its scratching reaction causes Dr. Li Jianku, a geneticist, to lose his footing and be left dangling. The mysterious Dr. Karloff moves like she is going to help, but actually cuts the strap on Lee's satchel, sending him falling. Sophia follows Karloff, locating the badly wounded Dr. Frank, and witnesses Karloff standing over the dead Irwin with a gun. Deciding that discretion is the brighter part of valor, Sophia falls back while Karloff radios for extraction. Retracing her steps, Sophia finds Frank has died, and then comes across Lee. The two hustle to escape the six-kilometer blast radius as the UN drops their bomb, obliterating the kaiju, as well as any other evidence of what may have happened. Uh, the issue's off to a fast start here as we jump right into the action, eh? Get it? Jump? Action? Okay. The high concept of kaiju samples being a hot commodity is one which has, at this point, a solid history in the daikaiju genre. While obviously a big part of the Pacific Rim franchise from the very beginning, the earliest instance of this device that comes to mind, for me, is 1989 in Godzilla vs. Biolanti, as different factions literally battle in the ruined streets of Tokyo to possess the Godzilla cells. As such, its presence in the Stomped universe is not a surprise, but at the same time, it's also welcome, because it's a plot point which can be taken in multiple directions. Here, with the team appearing to be of a singular purpose and mission, despite having never met each other, as well as the innoble fate of Dr. Akari, who I didn't even name in the synopsis, the guy that gets eaten out of the sky, it led me as a reader to believe that this was going to be a story of surviving a mission which has gone belly up really bad, really fast. The twist of having Karloff having an agenda all her own surprised me, 
especially the lengths to which she went to get the samples. Of course, this begs the question of who does she work for? And what do they want with the kaiju samples? I am assuming this will come up in a later storyline. Speaking of which, from the back matter in the sketchbook, we learn that Sophia will be returning, as Razki is building up a stable of characters for the series. We don't learn too much about Sophia here, but we do get her origin as well as a sense of her character when she helps both Frank and Lee during the mission. The sketchbook shows her with a cybernetic arm in place of her more realistic prosthesis, so looking forward to seeing how that comes into play. Radke's art's well executed in this story. One touch right up front which I liked was color coding the wingsuits. On page 2, Radke gives us a grid of panels introducing all six members of the team and showing us the color of their suit. Since the suits include helmets, this visual shorthand makes identifying who is who much easier in the rest of the story. The coloring in general is really nice, including the yellow-green shade of the kaiju's eyeball and the pale yellow-white of the symbiote creature. Our kaiju this time out is the reptile we saw on the cover. The monster is an octopod, with six legs along with two smaller claws tucked up under its neck. The head is sort of a squashed crocodile, but with a very monstrous jawline, along the lines kind of of Orga from Godzilla 2000, along with the head spines, which remind me for all the world like Varan. It's a well-designed monster. I especially like the character touches we see in its body language, such as casually snatching a Kari out of the air with its frog tongue, or swiping at its face like a dog when stabbed in the eye. Our kaiju is nicknamed Mokele Mbeembe, after the legendary cryptid from the Congo River Basin, which I'm sure I remember hearing about when I was a kid. It's been that that cryptid's been out there for a long time. Uh, this amused me, as there's also a Titan with this name over in the MonsterVerse. Although I do not believe we've ever seen that Titan on screen or in a comic. So in my head, until proven otherwise, they are the same monster. So uh, Titan Mokele Mbembe looks like uh, the, mon the kaiju Mokele Mbembe from this story, as far as I'm concerned. Page 1 has two panels which I would like to call out. The first panel of the story shows Mokele Mbembe moving off into the background, with the ruins of Bratzaville behind them. The scale of Mokele among the city is wonderful, really showing off his size, and the colors, all oranges and yellows, are really sharp. We also, in very small, uh, see this very small aspect, see the plane carrying the team in pursuit, which I missed the first time I read the story, so I appreciated uh, that on the reread, spotting that little detail. Panel 3 again shows Mokele and the plane, but this time from higher up as the monster walks across the savanna. Again, the size and scale of the monster against the huge expanse of open space is pulled together ni nicely. It immediately helps us understand McKelly's characteristics. The sense of scale again is used well on page 4, when the team is dropped onto McKelly, the plane being shown smaller than the monster's jaw, and the humans being literally dots in the sky above him. You folks know, I'm a sucker for a kaiju comic showing scale like this, and I think Radke did really well here with those images. Overall, eye for an eye, it's a strong strip, a great way to start the issue. Radke introduces us to a new character, as well as setting up plot points which can be revisited down the road. I definitely dug this one. Our second story is entitled Long Jump. Our writer is Ross Radke. Our artist is Hugo Feel Permu Perme. Um, he wrote the horror, or he uh, drew the horror story in stomp number two. Uh, Mr. Hugo, we're going to call him. That's what uh, both Ross and I were not 100% sure how to pronounce his name. So Mr. Hugo it is. Uh, good to see him back from uh, stomp two. And lettering again by Hassan Atsmane el Hal. Our story is once again 12 pages. And our synopsis goes like this. In Kiev, Ukraine, Darya Shamalik trains hard in long jump hitting huge distances but stepping over the tow board as she does show. While training, she and her team see a news broadcast about Kim Corgan battling a kaiju on her own in the United States. Her team is in disbelief, claiming that the U.S. must be making hybrid soldiers. The news simply infuriates Daria, who spirals into an abyss of indulgence and debauchery. Waking up in her apartment after a wild night, Daria is shocked to see a kaiju attacking her city. A young mother recognizes her as an athlete and begs Daria to rescue her child, trapped across a gulf in the asphalt. Daria uses a ramp to long jump across the gap and grab the kid. 
On the way back, she was not able to make it all the way, grabbing the ledge with her fingers. The kid is saved, but Darya is hit by falling debris before she can also be pulled to safety. Darya awakens in a hospital bed, but when she tries to make her way out, she collapses on the floor, discovering that both of her legs have been amputated above the knee. Later, in a wheelchair, Darya prepares to throw herself in front of a train. She is pr- approached by one Dr. Demikov, a kaiju researcher specializing in regeneration. Demikov tells Darya that her organization has begun human trials, and that Darya would make a great story. Demikov then asks Darya a simple question. How would you like to run again? A definite change of pace from the first story, but again, showing that humans and kaiju do not mix well. The story serves primarily as the introduction and origin of Darya, although oddly enough, her name is never stated in the story, only in the sketchbook. In those sketchbook pages, Radke says that he wanted Kim Corgan to have a rival, someone who could be a friend or an enemy depending on the situation. Darya's look certainly sets her up as a rival to Kim, both being tall gals with tattoos, but Darya clearly leaning into the Eastern European tough chick motif. Uh, This fits in well with the Olympic training beat, for those of us old enough to remember the many jokes in the 1980s about the Soviet Union's women in the Olympics. Here, the emergence of Kim Corgan is a straw which breaks Darya's back. What chance do I have to be the best when the U.S. has literal superhumans? But that said, I really liked how, despite all of her reckless hard partying, when the chips were down and someone needed help, Darya still helped them, literally throwing herself into danger to help an innocent kid, and paying a huge price for it. Her depression after the loss of her legs is palpable, and honestly seems earned if I'm being, you know, being fair about it. But as we have talked about in this show many times, all lives have value. Darya finding an opportunity to reinvent herself is both a positive ending as well as an ominous one. Her team was bemoaning that the U.S. was creating some sort of human-kaiju hybrid, but that's exactly what it sounds like Demikov is offering her. Setting the story in Ukraine was a nice move, continuing the trend of this series of being truly global, which is, of course, reflected in Eye for an Eye earlier in this issue as well. Now, of course, Ukraine has been on all our minds for a while now, but beyond the real-world implications, it's once again nice to see that the kaiju literally can show up in any corner of the world at any time in this universe, with seemingly no rhyme or reason as to why they choose one location or another. Mr. Hugo is a good choice for the art on this story, as uh, he has a style which I would reasonably describe as being punk, and Darya easily fits into that style. He also nails the action scenes dead on, including both sequences of Darya's long jump prowess. As someone who did the long jump and the triple jump in high school, I was immediately drawn to Darya and into the story from this element. The two biggest moments artistically in the story, however, have nothing to do with the action. The two-page spread showing Darya's descent into self-destructive behavior is truly a sight to behold. It starts out with a series of tall panels, about two-thirds height of the page, showing her taking a bong hit, eating junk food, and getting a tattoo while smoking a joint. Then the panels begin to tumble over, swirling down into a literal vortex as she does lines of coke, has a three-way, down some sort of liquid out of a glass, and drops X. This climaxes on the shorter panels on the bottom of the spread where, while drinking on a bridge in the rain, she tries to perform a long jump, only to faceplant on the road. Youch. It's not a pretty scene, but hot dang the artwork is nice. The other page which stands out is the reveal of the loss of Daria's legs. The page is almost completely silent other than the repeated beep of her monitors and then her anguished scream, which is cut off by the edge of the page. Hugo's incredibly expressive facial work, combined with the colors here, truly sell the horror of the scene. The kaiju this time out does not have a nickname, but it is the insectoid monster from the cover. We don't get to see too much of it in the story, mostly the devastation it causes as it marches through the city. Still, I will always have some affection for a mantis-like monster because, inevitably, they remind me of Kamakuras, a monster I have come to appreciate more as an adult than I ever did as a kid. Additionally, a mantis monster always also reminds me of the old AMT Gigantics kit of the giant mantis. My father built all four of the Gigantics kits and had them on display for literally as long as I can remember. Makes me wish I was a better modeler. The best shot of the monster here is where Hugo almost completely hides it. 
As the mother pleads for Darya to save the kid, we see the kaiju's claw and glowing eye peeking out from around the edge of the ruined building, a creepy hot pink in a sea of shadows. Nice work. Overall, Long Jump is a solid character piece which benefits a lot from the well-paired art and story. Much like with Sophia, I'm interested in what happens to Darya, and I'm eager to see the next chapter in her story. The first story was more of a monster comic, while this works better as a study and origin story. Still, a very enjoyable strip. Our third story is entitled Wake. The writing and colors are by Ross Radke, with the line art by Joshua Green. Our story is six pages, and the synopsis goes like this. As a kaiju attacks a city, a team of brave volunteers rush to save the lives of those trapped among the rubble. As the battle between the military and the monster rages on the streets, the team pulls men and women out of the collapsed buildings. One volunteer hears a kid, but right as he gets a hold of him, the floor drops out, sending them into the darkness below. As the kaiju heads out to sea, the rest of the team is able to locate the rescue worker and kid, who innocently asks if he gets to ride in the helicopter. In the sketchbook, Radke says that Wake was written specifically as a collaboration with Green, as that is the only stomp collaborator who lives within driving distance. Radke also details the process by which he colors Green's line work, which was very cool for non-artistic types, just as yours truly, to look over. And now, this is a very basic story, which to me serves two purposes. Firstly, to establish the idea of kaiju volunteer rescue teams, of which I'm totally in favor, and secondly, as an artistic showcase to Green. On both fronts, I think it does a good job. I wish we got to know the who these rescue volunteers were. None of them are named, or at least in what city this is taking place. But comparing a kaiju attack to a natural disaster is, again, a welcome daikaiju theme, and I'm glad that Radke is using it here. The artwork is very much in the quirky independent variety, very different from both other stories in this issue. The monster design looks like the combination of Lovecrafty and Old One, and Beetle Master from King of Monsters 2 is even colored similarly to that SNK monster, along with flaps of skin under its forelimbs like a flying squirrel, or, once again, Varan, if you prefer. Green also does a great job on the military hardware, including one shot of an F-22 Raptor zooming towards the reader, which is wonderful. Overall, a nice backup strip, but with its short page length, there's not much time to get too involved in the story. Nice indie artwork complements the rest of the comic, primarily because of its differences. Our first pinup is by artist Grim Wilkins with colors by Ross Radke and depicts Kim Corgan in the gaping maw, I guess, of a kaiju, using her strength to push the jaw open and rip off a squishy piece, while a second squishy part has her ankle wrapped, around, wrapped up. Everything about the mouth of this kaiju is suitably gross, and Radke's colors only add to that grossness. I get strong Grace Choi vibes from William's take on Kim, and this is not a complaint. Uh, throw the Stomp logo on this and you have a cover of a future issue. Just straight up. Our second pinup is by Callum Stephen Diggle. Uh, it's a sort of daikaiju pastoral, where we have a peaceful riverside scene of a couple at a picnic with a riverboat, a cottage, a windmill, and then a dark indigo and pink monster looming behind it. I really like the composition here with the dissimilar elements all given equal shrift to the overall layout of the page. Thematically, the pinup makes me think of the coming ubiquity of the kaiju in this universe, and they seem to be everywhere with no explanation. Visually, I was reminded of the great comics artist Johnny Craig, who in his work for EC Comics had a wonderful knack for rendering completely normal, everyday scenes, except for one horrific element, which turned the entire image into grotesque. I don't know that this one works as a cover, but I was really glad it was included in this issue. Overall, Stomp number 3 is another superlative installment in this anthology series. The two lead stories are both strong enough to be the A story of the issue. The backup stands out on its own, plus the amount of back matter really pads out the book into a nice meaty package. I'm very glad that my friend Kirk Spencer, at Big5Army on Twitter, put me onto the earlier Kickstarter as I was able to really have a lot of fun reading and covering these comics, and I'm eager to continue to do so, starting with issue 4, and then with whatever comes after that. Now, if you would like to own Stomp number 3, I'm going to direct you to go to Ross Radke's website, which is rossradke.com, that's R-O-S-S, -S 
R-A-D-K-E.com. And on his web store, you can get a digital version of Stomp Number 3. Now, the physical copies of Stomp Number 3, I believe, are entirely sold out. They may appear on, um, they, I don't, when I checked the web store, there were no physical copies available. I don't know if they're going to be reprinted. I know that I got mine from the Kickstarter. But if you go on to, like I said, go to Ross Radke's site, you can get issue number three digitally. And I believe it's just a PDF with no DRM. So you don't got to deal with any fancy apps or anything like that if you'd like to read it. Um, so now I throw it out to you, the listener. Have you checked out Stomped? I know that I did see some names I recognized on the thank you page in the back from Kickstarter. So I know there's probably some of you out there. And I know we did cover it and got some good feedback from the previous uh, episode with Stomp and then the uh, Stomp Kickstarter 3 um, unboxing on YouTube. So I throw it to you. Do you like Stomp? Do you like indie comics? Are you into creator uh, and uh, crowdfunded comics? Or do you, you know just... Are you never really dabbled into that? I'd really like to hear your thoughts on this one, so please email me, earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com, or you can reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter or uh, or YouTube, and uh, we'll talk about it here on the show. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we will do listener feedback and close out the show here on Earth Destruction Directive. Kenny, I'm starting a podcast. Recruit me and co-host with Attitude. Hi, hi, hi. What the heck? I thought we put that teleporter in storage. Uh, Michael? Next time you want me on Kaiju Weekly, tell Jimmy to... Drop the act, Nathan. (laughs) This is not the Monster Island Film Vault. Okay, fine. But what's going on? I'm having you join me on The Power Trip, a journey through the Power Rangers franchise. It's a podcast version of the article series I'm writing for Kaiju Ramen Magazine. Oh, interesting. We'll spend a year analyzing the Power Rangers franchise, dedicating an episode to each season and movie. Ah, I see. So we'll be doing an overview and talking about them in broad strokes. Exactly. We'll discuss Ranger teams, the villains, the theme songs, and so much more. Can we give out fun awards for stuff like the best fight scene and the craziest moments like I do on Henshin Men? You bet. More phenomenal. When do we start? We drop episodes every two weeks starting Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. You know what that means, Michael. It's Morphin' Time. All right, we are back here on Earth Destruction Directive. I hold in my hand the listener feedback. If you would like to get in touch with the show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. You can reach me on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or on our Discord server. Uh, Listen to the outro and check the show notes to get all the information on all of those uh, available ways to get in touch with the show. So our email today comes from Nathan Marchand and it is entitled Meeting Jason David Frank. Nathan writes, Hi Luke, this is Nathan Marchand again, but this time I'm writing as a representative of the Power Trip podcast. I heard you mention the death of Jason David Frank in the news section of an episode and then a listener wrote in about him in another episode. I thought I'd briefly share my story about meeting JDF earlier this year at Indiana Comic Con. You can hear the full story in a bonus episode of The Power Trip. I can confirm everything that's been said about JDF. He was energetic and charismatic and loved his fans. I stood in line all afternoon to meet him and get autographs from me and my co-host Michael, who's an even bigger fan of him than me. JDF even skipped out on his own Q&A panel because he wanted to make sure everyone in line got to meet him and get a signature. It took a long time because he made each encounter personal and special. He even highlighted a three-year-old boy who broke his arm the day before and still woke up that morning and said, I have to go meet Tommy. When I finally got to JDF, I had him sign my Super 7 Green Ranger figure for Michael and a Lightning Collection Green Ranger figure for me. He also spontaneously offered to record a video message for Michael when I said he couldn't make it. It's special to Michael now because he never had the pleasure of meeting JDF. My biggest get was I politely asked him if he'd do a shout out for the power trip that I could play before each episode, and he did. We've used it before every episode since, and while the podcast is shifting to Super Sentai coverage next season, we're keeping that shout out as a tribute. For those who didn't get to meet him, I'll repeat what Jack G-Man Hudgens said on a charity stream a bunch of us held to JDF. Even if you didn't meet him, he loved you 
because he loved all his fans. Keep them stomping and morphing. Sincerely, Nathan Marchand, Power Trip Podcast. Thank you very much, Nathan. First off, thank you for taking time to write in. Really appreciate it. And yeah, you know, everything we've heard about JDF, it's, it's, I've, I've not heard anything negative from anyone who ever interacted with him. It's always been just positive, positive memories, positive stories about, you know, how much goodness he brought into the world. And that just makes, you know, his loss that much, that much more tragic, right? You know, and, and we've said it over and over. And I've, I've also said, I really want to stop talking about this subject, but it keeps seeming to come up that every life has, has value and every life has meaning. And, you know, if, uh, think about this, okay. JDF left this, this gap. So, and you know, he, like you said, it was nothing but positivity and love, you know? So maybe that should be what we go out there and try to put more positivity and love out into the universe and use his, uh, his death as a, a rallying cry and an example. So thank you very much, Nathan, for writing in. Really appreciate it. Of course, Nathan uh, hosts several shows, including the power trip, uh, AKA the two man power trip podcast and uh monster Island film vault, henshin men. So, uh, he's, he's out there. You can, you can find Nathan and, uh, yeah, your, your, uh, patron is, is appreciated as always. Social media likes, shares, retweets, all that good stuff for the last couple episodes came from Billy D, AKA Doc Strange, Brian Severe, my brother, Jason Giaconetti, Robert Ludwig, the most sane man among us, Tim Elliott, Chris Mounts, Mr. Lomax, John Vanover, Colleen Alexander, Adam Tebow, the two true freaks podcast network. Bro Rad, Siskoid, the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network, the Henshin Men Podcast, Crystal Lady Jessica, Laura Hertzman, the aforementioned Nathan Marchand and Jimmy from NASA, together they are, the Monster Allen Film Vault, Chuck Rodriguez, the History of Comics on Film, Derek Derek WC from the Fan Holes Podcast, the Trekker Talk Podcast, Jesse Garrett, Magazines and Monsters Podcast, CJ Reed, and Chris Maxwell. Thank you very much, everyone. You know, all that social media, it's great for helping to spread word about the show, uh, get it out there for more people to find. I say it all the time. These shows, of course, are a labor of love, and uh, every little bit uh, every little bit helps, and every podcaster appreciates getting that positive bit of feedback from their listeners, and I am no different. I really appreciate all of that social media uh, love that we got there. So thank you for that. Also, I'd like, of course, to remind everyone that Earth Destruction Directive is for everyone. If you are interested and a fan of Japanese giant monsters of the Daikaiju scene, um, you know, you can interact with this show in any way that you feel comfortable. You know, we're not, I say it all the time, we're not a gatekeeping show, we're a show for the people. So, uh, all are welcome at Earth Destruction Directive, as always. All right, so, we're about to, you know, we come to the end of another episode, and as always, we must be forever looking forward. And what's coming next? Well, next month is an anniversary that I was uh, I knew was coming intellectually, but, you know, emotionally, I don't know that I'm quite ready for this. Because next month, it's the 25th anniversary of Godzilla 98. And if Godzilla 98 is 25 years old, that would mean that I am north of that, and I I don't know that I'm ready to be uh, in a world where Godzilla 98 is 25 years old, but here we are, so that's what we're going to be covering. We're going to be taking a look at the uh, Devil and an Emmerich Godzilla uh, back from a, a more innocent time, and yet not so innocent time when it came to uh, fan backlash. So I have not seen this film in a while. I think the last time I saw it was probably the Rift Tracks Live version of it. So looking forward to sitting down with this film and, you know, maybe talking about not just the film, but maybe what it's, uh, you know, what, what it spawned as far as a, a marketing campaign, its legacy, and maybe American remakes in general. But you know what? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's watch the movie first and we'll give our thoughts. So uh, very much looking forward to that course any news that comes up about the new empire or about gamma rebirth or anything else we'll definitely get you updated on that hopefully firm up the date for shin common rider uh for fathom events uh and anything else there's been seems to be a lot of news news seems to be coming fast and furious and not to mention the fact that we got a new fast and furious but that doesn't have anything to do with godzilla so there you go all right folks that's all i've got thank you very much for downloading and listening. Please come back next time when we're going to talk about Godzilla 98. And until then, keep them stomping. This has been Earth Destruction Directive, a Daikaiju podcast. 
Produced and created by me, Luke Giaconetti, as part of the Two True Freaks Internet Radio Network, available at twotruefreaks.com. This is a fan work celebrating the history and culture of Japanese giant monsters. All movies, TV shows, comic books, characters, and other intellectual property is copyright their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. If you would like to send an email to the show, you can email me at earthdestructiondirective at yahoo.com. I try to respond to all emails, and if you send in some comments, I will read them on the show. All episodes of Earth Destruction Directive can be found at 2TrueFreaks.com. You can also find the show on your favorite podcatcher. Just search for Earth Destruction Directive. You can even leave a review on your podcatcher of choice if you'd like. You can find me on Facebook. Just search for first name Luke, last name E-D-D. You can also get in touch with me on Twitter. Just search for the handle at L Giacone. That's L-J-A-C-O-N-E. The theme song for this podcast is Future Gladiator by Kevin McLeod, downloaded from Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 license. Thanks for listening, and be sure to come back next time for more city-stomping fun here on Earth Destruction Directive. Tune in next time to hear the crusty old podcaster from Oklahoma say, There's a WTF (laughs) moment if I ever saw one.